so glad again that you're here this morning. Uh, we are beginning a brand new series today that we're called the parables, and we're going to be looking at some of the parables that Jesus told. Now, to put it simply, parables are just stories with morals. All right, they're a story with a lesson. But I think if we just define Jesus' parables as moral lessons, then we actually do them a disservice. These stories are supposed to make us uncomfortable. How many baseball fans do we have today? All right, I'm a big baseball fan. And you know if you're a baseball fan, if a pitcher wants to get a hitter's attention, right, he'll throw a pitch high and tight, right? It's called chin music. It knocks the batter back. It will often anger the battle. Sometimes they will fight because of it, right? Jesus' point in telling parables was not just to tell a nice moral story and then pat his hearers on the head and then wish them a good night. Jesus' point in telling parables was to go high and tight, to knock people back, to, to make people uncomfortable. As we listen to Jesus' parables, we are meant to put ourselves into the stories. We are the characters. These are not stories that we are meant to hold at arm's length, right? We are meant to put ourselves into them. But when we do that, we have to be ready to be, to be made extremely uncomfortable. And so I'm sure many of you have heard, if not some, if not all the parables that we're going to look at here in the series. But my hope and my prayer is that you will hear them with, with new ears. In fact, what I want you to do right now to yourself is ask the Holy Spirit to give you new ears to hear these stories like it's the first time that you've heard them. All right, especially today, because today we're beginning the series with probably one of the most famous parables in all the Bible. We're going to look at the parable of the Good Samaritan. Right? We know the story, don't we? We know what it means to be a good Samaritan. Even people outside of the church know what it means to be a good Samaritan. It has become part of our lexicon, right? To be called a good Samaritan is a compliment. It means you're a person of, of compassion. It means that you care for people. Those are good things. I don't know anyone who would be offended by being called a good Samaritan. And so if we, it, so it would be easy for us to think, well, I know the point of this sermon is to be a good person, so now I can just zone out. But if you think that's all this story is about, then you're missing so very much. See, Jesus was not telling this story just to tell people to be nice. This is a story about salvation. In fact, every parable is a salvation story. It may not seem that way at first, but if we dig deeper, then we'll see it. Jesus said in Matthew eleven sixteen, 16, anyone with ears to ear should listen and understand. See, church, listening is not enough. Understanding is key. This is why you hear people talking about studying Scripture. Think back when you were in school. All right, some of you are still in school. You know that, that there's a difference between studying and simply reading the material. I was great at reading the material. Studying, not so much. Amen? Some of y'all were there with me. By just reading the material, you might walk away with like a cursory knowledge of the material, but you can't say you really know the material. And you know that when you take the test, right? You realize, I didn't study this material. The Word of God needs to be studied in order to be understood. So if you have ears this morning, don't just listen, but understand. The parable is found in Luke chapter 10. We're going to start in verse 30. So grab your Bible or your phone. Let's get into God's Word. Grab your Bible, grab your phone. Are you ready to feast on the Word of God today, church? All right, let's do this. Luke chapter 10, starting in verse 30. Jesus replied with a story. A Jewish man was traveling from Jerusalem down to Jericho, and he was attacked by bandits. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him up, and left him half dead beside the road. 
By chance, a, a priest came along. But when he saw the man lying there, he crossed the other side of the road and passed him by. A temple assistant walked over and looked at him lying there, but he also passed by on the other side. Then a despised Samaritan came along. And when he saw the man, he felt compassion for him. Going over to him, the good Samaritan soothed his wounds with olive oil and wine and bandaged them. Then he put the man on his own donkey and took him to an inn where he, could take, where he, could, where he took, took care of him. The next day, he handed the innkeeper two silver coins, telling him, Take care of this man. If his bill runs higher than this, I'll pay you the next time I'm here. Now, which of these would you say was a neighbor to the man who was attacked by bandits, Jesus asked. The man replied, the one who showed him mercy. Then Jesus said, yes, now go and do the same. Now again, a cursory read of that tells us, be kind. And again, that is one of the lessons in that story. If you see someone in need, you should help. This past week, our church bought 12 wigs and 12 headscarves to send to Venezuela uh, for women who have lost their hair due to uh, chemotherapy. Right At a gathering church, we care a lot about helping when we are given the opportunity. So the parable of the Good Samaritan speaks directly to that. But church, it goes deeper than that. As I said, this parable, like all parables, is about salvation. It's telling, in telling this parable, Jesus is engaging in personal evangelism. But if we just read this parable outside of context, we would never know that. So let me, let me say something real quickly to you. One of the most important things for you to know when it comes to studying scripture is to always read script, the scripture right before the passage and right after the passage, right? When you're studying scripture, always read the passage right before it and right after it because context is key. When we snatch scripture out of context, one of two things can happen. We can completely misunderstand the passage or we don't fully understand the passage, right? We call this proof texting. When we take scripture out of context, we can do a lot of damage. A lot of bad sermons have been preached due to proof texting. A lot of harmful sermons have been preached due to proof texting. It is vital, church, that we understand how a passage fits in with the passages around it and ultimately how it fits into the greater narrative of the Bible. And so if you will go to gatheringatl.com and click on resources, you will find a ton of short videos that will help you understand the Bible, each book of the Bible, and even more. And so in relationship to, in relation to the parable of the Good Samaritan, we need to back up a few verses today. We need to go back to verse 25. So I want us to look at verses 25 through 29. Because this is why Jesus told the parable of the Good Samaritan. Jesus didn't tell the parable just because he felt like telling it. He had a purpose. He was responding to a question, or more accurately, he was responding to a couple of questions. And the questions are the key to fully understanding the parable of the Good Samaritan. And so look at it with me, Luke chapter 10, starting at verse 25. One day, an expert in religious law stood up to test Jesus by asking him this question. Teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus replied, what does the law of Moses say? How do you read it? The man answered, you must love your Lord, the, Lord, the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, and all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. Right, Jesus told him. Do this and you will live. The man wanted to justify his actions, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Now look at verse 25 again. One day an expert in religious law stood up to test Jesus by asking him this question. You see, essentially, it was a lawyer asking this question. He was a religious lawyer. He was an expert in Old Testament law. And because he was an expert, he was convinced that he could get Jesus to say something that went against Jewish law. Then they could not only accuse him of blasphemy, but now they would have proof of blasphemy. And if they could get proof, then they could, uh, they could get, they would have all they would need in order to have him executed. And so this, this man was not asking a question because he was genuinely curious. He had an ulterior motive. You need to understand this. 
See, I'm not telling you that he's a lawyer in order to paint him as the villain of the story. I mean, he's a lawyer. I don't have to do too much work there, all right? I'm kidding if you're a lawyer. Uh, but I want you to understand that even though he had ulterior motives, Jesus understood that his actions were based on a misunderstanding of God's word. Or more accurately, Jesus understood that this man knew God's word, but didn't really know God's word, right? Look at what he asked. Teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? Now, some of you may remember the story of Jesus and the rich young ruler, right? The rich young ruler asked the same question. Teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? That is the most important question that anyone could ever ask, right? It's even more important than asking who do you think is going to win the Georgia-Alabama game? Roll, roll Tide needs to leave. Um, <laughs> But what should I do to inherit eternal life is the most important question anyone can ask. And this lawyer, he's asking the right person, right? He's asking Jesus, what should I do to inherit eternal life? Now, a lot of us would expect Jesus to say, believe in me, or, or worship me, or, or bow down to me, something like that, right? But Jesus goes in a totally unexpected direction. Jesus responds with, what does the law of Moses say? How do you read it? Remember, this man was an expert in the law of Moses or the Old Testament law. He knew it. You were not going to trip this man up. He knew the letter of the law. But he did not understand the intent of the law. Those are two very different things. Again, he had the head knowledge, but not the heart knowledge. And so his response to Jesus was technically correct. He said, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, and all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. But right? in that statement, he, he sums up the Ten Commandments, right? The first four commandments deal with loving God, and the, and the other eight deal with loving others. So he is technically correct. Love God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, and all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. That is the definition of perfect love. When you hear me talk about being made perfect in love, that's what I'm talking about. Loving God with everything you've got. Loving others, or loving ourselves with everything you've got, and then loving others with everything we've got. That is perfect love. So again, the man's answer was correct. Right? Jesus said so in verse 28. Jesus said, right, do this and you will live. Remember, I said every parable is a salvation story. There's the proof. Jesus said, do this and you will live in response to the question, how do I inherit eternal life? But we can miss that if we expect Jesus just to say, worship me. But then we might actually ask, but why doesn't he say, worship me? Right? Wouldn't that be easier? But if I'm asking Jesus, what do I do to, to, to inherit eternal life? Wouldn't it be easier for him to say, worship me, bow down to me? Why go about it this way? Because Jesus is dealing with another issue. Jesus was dealing with how the man viewed himself. Right? One preacher in, in relation to this story said, there is no good news unless the man accepts the bad news. See, this man had no interest in looking himself in the mirror. The proof is in verse 29. It says, the man wanted to justify his actions. It's so easy for us to rush by those words. The man wanted to justify his actions. What does that mean? Look in, uh, in verse 29. It says, the man wanted to justify his actions. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? See, all the man cared about, after that incredible story, all the man cared about was Jesus' definition of the neighbor. That's it. He was curious if Jesus had a different definition of neighbor. And so in his eyes, that's probably all that he needed to work on. Maybe he had this limited definition of the word neighbor. And so I'll, I'll expand my definition of neighbor a little bit, and then I will be A-OK. -okay. You see, he, he could never accept that he wasn't right with God. I mean, he knew the law. He could not fathom the thought that he was not right with God. He could not fathom the thought that he was not justified. He could not fathom the thought that, that he didn't really have eternal life. He just knew he loved God, and he knew he loved his neighbors. But 
hold on a second, who is my neighbor? In the Sermon on the Mount, which is a sermon Jesus preached, you can find it in Matthew. In Matthew 5, 43, Jesus said, You have heard the law that says, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Right? That's, that's common thinking, right? And I can imagine when Jesus stood up there and said, you've heard the law that says, love your neighbor and hate your enemy, that some folks in the crowd like, amen, preach it, brother. But unfortunately for them, Jesus kept preaching. Then Jesus said, but I say, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Let's just be honest, church. There are people we do not like. Now, I know we we're in church and we think it would make us look bad if we actually admitted that there are people we don't like. But at the same time, however, you actually want to lie in church. All right? There are people that we do not like. And so our definition of the word neighbor is closely tied to whether we like them or not. So in that sense, we are limiting the definition of the word neighbor. When you bought your house... You really didn't have a choice who your neighbors were going to be. I mean, after you bought your house, right? Before you bought the house, you could look at the yards around you and, and the neighborhood around you and decide if you actually wanted to live there. But once you buy the house, those folks are your neighbors, whether you like them or not. Whether you like them or not does not stop them from being your neighbor. Someone here needs to hear that today. Whether you like the person next door or not does not stop them from being your neighbor. See, the most basic definition of the word neighbor is the people around you, wherever you are. That's it. It doesn't matter if they don't cut their grass. They are your neighbor. But the, for the religious experts Jesus butted heads with, they define neighbor their own way. <laughs> they did most definitely did not define neighbor as someone they did not like or love. Right? They did not love their enemies. They did not love the stranger. Even being a fellow Jew did not mean they would love you. The only people they loved were people who were part of their very narrow and elite group. But I'll be honest, they could back it up with Scripture. Right? They could easily quote Psalm 139, 21 and 22 to show that their behavior was justified. Psalm 139 says, Oh Lord, shouldn't I hate those who hate you? Shouldn't I despise those who oppose you? Yes, I hate them with total hatred, for your enemies are my enemies. See, to them, that was virtuous behavior, to hate the haters of God. Why wouldn't they hate the haters of God? And so they, they turned the hatred, of, uh, the hatred of, the, of the enemies of God into a virtue that allowed them to write people off. It allowed them to ignore the suffering of others. This is why Jesus told the parable of the Good Samaritan. The religious scholar simply did not know the definition of the word neighbor. So Jesus is about to go high and tight to reveal to this religious scholar who claims to love God that he does not have a clue. And if we put ourselves into this parable, Jesus is going to go high and tight on us as well. And so hold on, because here comes the pitch. Jesus said, a Jewish man was traveling from Jerusalem down to Jericho. Okay, so the Jewish law is probably like, okay, one of us, one of us, a story about one of us, a Jew, and he was attacked by bandits. Okay, now, as a Jew, I'm invested in the story, another Jew is attacked. He's one of ours, right? And so just so you know, the road from Jerusalem to, to, to Judah, or to Jericho, was an incredibly dangerous road. Not only is it steep, but it was full of bandits at the time. Right? So if you took that road, you took your life into your hands to make that journey. And so those listening to Jesus would have been surprised to hear about a man, would not have been surprised to hear about a man attacked on that road. But then Jesus said, by chance, a priest came along. Whew, okay, here comes some help. Right here, here comes some hope for this man. This priest, would, he's going to take care of everything, I'm sure. But not so fast. 
When he saw the man lying there, he crossed to the other side of the road and passed him by. The priest put as much distance between himself and the beaten man as possible. He didn't just move over enough to pass. He crossed to the other side of the road. He got as far away from loving his neighbor as possible. So the priest... The religious leader has no love for his neighbor and therefore does not love God. But then here comes the temple assistant. I mean, he's, he's not a priest, but he's still a religious leader. He might have been at the bottom of the temple chain of command, but he's still an important person. Surely this guy was going to help. But Jesus said a temple assistant walked over, looked at him lying there, but he also uh, passed by on the other side. The temple says it went over to look at him. He got it close, and when he saw him, you would think he would help, but no, he got as far away as possible. He, too, had no love for his neighbor, therefore he did not love God. See, Jesus' message is clear, church. This is high and tight. Don't think for a second that memorizing the Bible, going to church, being baptized or putting some money in the offering basket means you love God. This is supposed to knock you back a little bit. And then Jesus goes in for the kill. Then a despised Samaritan came along. Now those, those listening to him that day would have thought, oh crud, this beaten man's life is about to get a thousand times worse. Because to the Jews, there was nothing worse than a Samaritan. In fact, if you wanted to insult someone, you would have called them a Samaritan. Samaritans were hated. They were seen as leeches to the Jews. And so as soon as Jesus mentioned a Samaritan showing up, those listening would have expected the worst. But Jesus, as we have talked about, he loves a surprise. He says, then a despised Samaritan came along, and when he saw the man, he felt compassion for him. Now that in and of itself would have been shocking. Jesus didn't stop there. Jesus is coming high and tight, folks. He said, going over to him, the Samaritan soothed his wounds with olive oil and wine and bandaged him. Then he put the man on his own donkey and took him to an inn where he took care of him. The next day, he handed the innkeeper two silver coins, telling him, take care of this man. If his bill runs higher than this, I'll pay you the next time I'm here. So the Samaritan, he treats the man's room, wounds, but he doesn't stop there. He then took him to an inn, and he got him a room, and he cared for them. But he didn't stop there. He stayed with the man all night. How do I know that? Jesus said, the next day. That means the Samaritan stayed with the beat man all night long and cared for him. But he didn't stop there. The next day, he handed the innkeeper two silver coins and said, take care of this man. If the bill runs higher than this, I'll pay him the next time I'm here. And there are two ways to look at that. Either this Samaritan is an absolute idiot, or this Samaritan truly understands love and compassion. See, it would be easy to think this Samaritan man was setting himself to be up, setting himself up to be taken advantage of, right? That is the perfect recipe for extortion. How does he know the innkeeper isn't going to lie and claim that it took him four silver coins to take care of this man when it didn't? The fact is, the Samaritan, he doesn't know, and that's the point. Hear me, church. True love is lavish love. This is love without limits. This is love without boundaries. True love means exposing yourself to being hurt. True love means exposing yourself to losing everything you've got. True love means giving until it hurts. If our love for God and for others doesn't make us uncomfortable or put us in uncomfortable situations, then we should question our love for God. After all, this is what our God did for us. Our God loved us enough to take on flesh. Our God loved us enough to allow himself to be tortured and killed. This is lavish love. And let's be honest, it's how we love ourselves, is it not? We love ourselves lavishly. We have no problem spending money on ourselves. We don't even question our own motives. But as soon as we are invited to spend money on someone else, we're asking for motives or looking for reasons not to give the money. 
We will spend all the time we want on ourselves. But as soon as someone asks us to spend a little of our time on them, well, that's a different story. We're called to pour ourselves out just as Jesus poured himself out for us. Isaiah 40, 31 is one of the most popular verses in all the Bible. It says, but those who trust in the Lord will find new strength. They will soar high on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. But here's the problem. So many people say they love Jesus, but they never really get to a point of needing new supernatural strength because they aren't pouring out everything they've got. We are called to love so lavishly that it requires the power of the Holy Spirit in order for us to keep going. But not only to go on, but to do so without ever growing tired of pouring ourselves out. This is how we love the Lord our God with all our heart, all our soul, all our strength, and all our mind. And this is how we love our neighbor as ourselves. This is the only way. That's why Jesus ended his story with a question. Now, which of these would you say was a neighbor to the man who was attacked by bandits? And the man replied, the one who showed the mercy. And then Jesus said, yes. Now go and do the same. Love lavishly. Pour out everything for anyone you can. Give it all away. That's what he did for you. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. Love the Lord your God with all your soul. Love the Lord your God with all your strength. Love the Lord your God with all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. Anything less does not work. Anything less is not holy. Folks, this should make us uncomfortable. This should make you want to push back a little bit. All right? This should convict us. Because I know I'm guilty of not loving like this. Time and time again, I fail at this. And I'm sure my wife and my kids can tell me plenty of, time, plenty of more times. But I confess that to you today. I fail at this often. The point of the parable of Good Samaritan is not about getting you to serve in some soup kitchen or to put more money in the offering basket. Both of those things are good. But the point of the parable of the Good Samaritan is to convict us of not loving Jesus with everything we've got so that we would fall at his feet and ask for forgiveness or for salvation. That is the point of the parable. The parable of Good Samaritan forces us to ask ourselves, do I love Jesus with everything I've got? Do I love my neighbor as I love myself? And if not, Lord, then I confess that I do not love Jesus with everything I've got. Folks, this is a high and tight sermon. And I'll be honest with you, I was uncomfortable writing this sermon because it just it knocked me back a bit. It hit me square between the eyes. Because I know the things in my life that give testimony to me not loving the Lord my God with everything I've got. I know the things in my life that give testimony to me not loving my neighbor as myself. How about you? How about you online? Do you love him lavishly? Do you love your neighbor lavishly? Or have you been like the religious scholar and created your own definition for what it means to love Jesus and others? If so, confess that today. Has there been a neighbor you have chosen not to love? Remember how we define neighbor. It's anyone around you wherever you are. Maybe it's you driving to the office. Maybe it's at the office. Maybe it's at school. Maybe it's an actual neighbor who lives next door. Maybe it's someone inside your house. Has there been a neighbor you have chosen not to love? Name them today. Have there been times you chose not to love lavishly? Name it today. Have you held back love, even though you say you worship God and who has never worship a God who's never held back his love for you? If so, confess that today. And know that forgiveness is available to you today. And now the really uncomfortable 
Park. I want to invite you to join me in a prayer. I want to invite you to join me in a prayer where we ask for an opportunity this week or this month to be a good Samaritan. A prayer where we ask for an opportunity where we are, we are, an opportunity where we're given an opportunity to, to love lavishly and that we would have the desire to do so. An opportunity where we are invited to pour everything out for the sake of another. I have no idea what that will look like in your life. Your situation will be different than mine. The question is, are you willing to ask for it? And maybe more importantly, are you willing to ask for the strength and the courage and the faith to follow through with it? Do you want to be known as someone who loves the Lord your God with everything you've got? Do you want to be known as someone who loves your neighbor as you love yourself? Do you? And I want to invite you to pray this prayer with me. I'll pray a line. I might you just pray it silently to yourself. I won't know if you're praying it. So this is between you and God. And then I'll close us in prayer. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, I acknowledge today that you have loved me lavishly. I acknowledge today that you have poured everything out for me. But I also acknowledge that I have failed to do that in my life. That there are times where I have held back my love for you and for others. And I confess that today. Lord, my desire is to love you with everything I've got. My desire is to love my neighbor as myself. As, as myself. And so, Lord, I come before you today asking for an opportunity to do just that. Whether it's this week or this month, Lord, I pray that you would lead me into a situation where I can be a good Samaritan. That you would lead me into a situation where I could pour out lavish love on someone else. And then Holy Spirit, give me the strength and the faith to actually do it. I pray this all in the name of Jesus. Amen. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for who you are. Lord, you heard our prayer today. I pray that we prayed it earnestly and honestly. So Lord, I pray that you would put us in that position this week or this month. That when we were there, we would recognize it. That you would speak, the Holy Spirit would speak to us and say, this is your moment right now. This is your moment right now. I'm calling you right now to be the Good Samaritan. I'm calling you right now to love lavishly on this person. I'm calling you right now to step outside of yourself, to expose yourself, to, to be taken advantage of or hurt. But I'm calling you to love on this person. Even the person that you disagree with politically, even the person you disagree with theologically, help us love them in their time of need as you have loved us and ours. So Lord, just give us the strength and the faith to do it. So that you would be glorified and that people would come to know that you love them lavishly as well. Pray this all in the name of Jesus.